I like to sing How Holy Our Lord Is because He is worthy. For some of you who don't know, that's His most important attribute, is His holiness. His love was what touched our hearts, but His most important attribute, for some of you who don't know, is His holiness. <laughs> Here we go. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning <clears throat> our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, which word and art and evermore shall be. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sin man, thy glory may not see. Only thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in power, in love and purity. Holy, 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 Lord God, all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Amen. Well, we're going to sing how much we love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So shall we sing 483 in your red hymnal, 483. You know, actually our singing got prettier, you know. I hear a lot more female voices that just makes it sound better. No offense to the gentleman, but it's just so refreshing where I can hear more ladies now. It just sounds more prettier this time. All right, 483. Now, guys, don't be shy. It's okay. Sing out loud. <laughs> there is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its word. Her, this sounds like music in mine ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. He, it tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells me what my Father hath in store for every day. Hey, and though I tread a darksome path, he'll sunshine all the way. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. 
It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. Amen. Amen. Do you love Jesus, folks? Amen. Amen. Please stand. Please stand. 500. 500. Oh, don't get me going now. When the roll is called up yonder. Don't get me going now. Lord, will you please sound your trump so that we can go to glory with you. I don't know about you, but I'm going to be there. Will you be there? Yeah. All right. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share, when his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Let us lay before the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the yonder when the roll is called up yonder I'll be there Amen. Amen. Woo. bless God all right brother Sean will you open up the service with a word of prayer please Yes. I need you, Lord. spiritual power and boldness to preach what you have for us today and have us to have us to hear from your word today, not from Gene and Kim. Amen. I pray, Heavenly Father, that if there's anyone uh, visiting today or joining that may not be saved, I pray that you would make today the day of their salvation. Yes, God, amen. I pray all these things in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. If you'll please take out your white hymnal. Please take out your white hymnal and turn to page eight, please. Page number eight. If you'll please take out your white hymnal and turn to page number eight. A little further, a little further, child, and we'll understand it better by and by. Tempted and tried, we're off made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long. While there are others living about us, never molesting though in the wrong. Father along, we'll know all about it. Father along, we'll understand why. Cheer up, my brother, live in the sunshine. We'll understand 
little by and by when death has come and taken our loved ones it leaves our home so lonely and drear then do we wonder why others prosper living so wicked year after year father along we'll know all about it father along we'll understand why cheer up my brother live in the sunshine we'll understand it all by and by faithful till death said our loving master a few more days to labor and wait tools of the road will then seem as nothing as we sweep through the beautiful day father along will know all about it father along will understand why cheer up my brother live in the sunshine we'll understand it all by and by when we see Jesus coming in glory, when he comes from his home in the sky, then we shall meet him in that bright mansion. We'll understand it all by and by. Father along will know all about it. Father along will understand why. Cheer up, my brother, live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. Amen. All right, then. So we'll ask Brother Tom to give the announcements for us. And uh, he has uh, one important announcement that you all might be interested in, actually. All right. Oh, you know, everybody's going to be Everybody's going to be interested in this one. Okay. Good morning, church. Love to have, thank you, Lord, for bringing all these people here. Blessed to have all of you here today. Um, so let's get started. Next Sunday, we're, we did visitation this Sunday. So next Sunday, we have street preaching at 10 a.m. We're going to meet at Andy's Barbecue near San Tomas Expressway. If you go to Google Maps and you actually search Andy's Barbecue, you'll actually just see Andy's Barbecue. It's really close. <laughs> Promise. Very close. We'll park there. Um, so for the February Fellowship, we're planning a church-wide fellowship. Let me know. Bug me about it. Let me know your availability. I'm going to bug all of you about it so we can try to get as many people's uh, schedules together as we can. So let us know. We're going to be watching Dr. Ruckman's Revelation movie. It's going to be about it's going to be about three hours long. I think it's the one that has his paintings on it. It's like a storytelling kind of fashion. So if you ever wondered about the Book of Revelation, it's a good way to good way to learn some something about it. Um, Thursday night discipleship. This is where the good stuff comes in. Okay. 7 to 8 p.m. is discipleship, but from 8 to 9, pastor's dad's going to be here, and he's going to be speaking to us. So if those of you who can make it, if you guys can come, it'll be a blessing. We're going to have, guess what, fried chicken. We're Baptists. We're going to have fried chicken afterwards. So we're going to have fun. We're going to have some fellowship. And uh, so for this week's memory verses, we're going to still be in Isaiah. We're actually just finishing up our review of Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 reminds me of... A lot of what the Lord Jesus Christ had to go through. All of these, remember, you got to remember, all of these prophecies came right on the money at the right time to the right person out of what, I don't know how many millions of people that lived throughout history. So those are some astronomical chances, if you guys, uh, you guys notice. So Isaiah 53, we're reviewing four verses at a time, and we're going to go from 9 to 12. Isaiah 53, 9 to 12. And the Bible says, And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. That sounds like somebody we know. Um, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. 
I don't know any other figure in the history that ever fits that description. So there's only one one man, one God. Also, one other announcement: they're selling Portuguese donuts downstairs for a uh, fundraiser. If you guys want donuts? I mean, they're they're pretty cheap apparently, and they're they're really big and they're tasty. So you guys can buy some of that stuff. Amen. And uh, we don't have any missionary letters, letters this week, so I'll pass it back over to our, my pastor. All right, amen. Um, I just want, I forgot to ask the brother, but uh, are you ready to sing the special today, brother? Or You can do it? All right, then. So, Brother Jack is going to sing us a special today, all right? All right, if the camera can make sure that it's aimed toward him. <laughs> For some of you guys that don't know my background, I came from a church that did a lot of praising and worshiping, everything, drums, guitars, yeah, loud right. instruments, <laughs> um, and I think a lot of times the message I got from, from there is, is that we could do a lot of repeating these words, but the Bible says don't oh, make those vain repetitions. Amen, Amen brother. And so, um, uh, the words are just as important, or even more important, actually. Amen. You right. cut that part out. I mean, the, words are, <laughs> the words are important. The words are important. That's right. Amen. Right. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Some of you guys might know this one, so. Uh, he is worthy. It's all good. Chapter 1, please. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I want to thank God I believe in dispensationalism. You might say, 
Okay, what does that mean, Pastor? What does dispensationalism mean? Dispensationalism, what that means is that throughout every time period, God had a different plan and a stage for men. That's, right. That's why you're going to find out that a lot of the things that we do as a church in this day, in this age, it's totally different from how the Old Testament Jews practiced, where they were observing the Sabbath, where if you took God's name in vain, you were stoned to death, where they were conquering nations through the sword. Obviously, the church doesn't do that. You might wonder, why is that? Because God had a different plan set up for different groups of people at different time periods. And if there was no dispensationalism, then we can't see how God's plan worked with mankind and how men, all they have to do is look back at the previous stages, the previous plans, and see how they messed God up. And so God had to start anew. God had to restore. And that's why I'm excited to preach today's preaching. If you're not a dispensationalist, you're not going to enjoy today's sermon. But if you're a dispensationalist, if you believe in this doctrine, you're going to enjoy what I'm going to preach to you today. What are you going to preach about? I'm going to preach out how you always messed up on God. And how God always works things together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to His purpose. In every dispensation, you'll notice it always ends with apostasy. But God is always at the end to work something better for His good. I hope that today's preaching will be a blessing to you because I'm sure a lot of you could use some encouragement today. Yeah. Heavenly Father, I need the power of the blood. I need the power of your Holy Spirit. I need the power of your word. I need the power of your might. And it, as that verse says, it is not by might. It is not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. I want to honor you from Genesis through Revelation today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat> As you notice, <clears throat> in Genesis 1, God started his first plan. And he made everything good. If you read the entire chapter, you're going to find out that God, he made everything good. Look at verse 31, please. Verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And God, that's what he does in your life, is that he always makes things good. He makes things perfect. I mean, he saved your soul from a burning hell. How much gooder can it get than that? He gave you a mansion up in heaven. How much gooder can it get than that? He's going to give you streets of gold to walk on. How much gooder can you get than that? He gave you a Bible-believing church to go to, to fellowship with yeah, brothers and God. sisters in Christ. That's so different from the lost, wicked world that influenced you to do the wrong things. How much gooder can it get than that? Didn't the Lord Jesus Christ, he promised that he will rapture you, free you from this prison and this body, this cage of sin? How much gooder can it get than that? Nothing can get gooder, better than what God has prepared and planned for us. Yeah. It was very good. Nothing can be better than what God has prepared for us. And you know, when God creates everything good, we always mess things up. I mean, as soon as you got saved and you go to church, you're on fire. You're like, man, I want to serve Jesus Christ. Man, I want to try to get a clean Christian household. Man, I want to start reading the book and start praying and start... I want to know how to witness to other people how to get saved. Will you... Will you help me out? And then we had that passion. We had that love and desire. Everything seemed to be perfect. At San Jose Bible Baptist Church. But then you give it a couple weeks and a couple months. And then this flesh kicks in. And then Satan starts whispering in your ear. And then you got your old habits returning. You got persecution from your loved ones and family members. Busyness from works from work arise, and then discouragement seeps at your heart, and then you know what you do? The perfect you that God had planned, you just messed it up. And then what happens is, is that from skipping one service turns to months and then to years. 
What happened to a fervent desire to read the word now just turned to a cold stare watching television and the internet? What happened to going to church now turned to going to work? What happened to laughing and fellowshipping with brothers and sisters in Christ Turn back to the wrong conversations and worldly conversations with your lost friends and family members. What happened to that? You messed it up. And then what did God do? He tried to pick you back up again. What did God do? He sent a sermon in your heart, a new song to sing, and then reminded you. And he sent down that chastening rod so that you can get back up again. And then you say, oh God, I messed it all up. And God says, no, my mercies are made new every morning and he sets up a new plan all over with you again get back on the saddle get back to church get back to reading the book get back to with the brethren get back to my word and get back to serving god yeah. and you know what you let god down again and you know what god will do every single time he will pick you back yeah. up again do you know why if we look at the evidence from genesis to revelation God always is on the throne picking up mankind all over again. Yeah. That's why I'm so excited to preach to you this message. I'm going to tell you about how man, mankind, oh, we talk so great about mankind. This wicked world just says, oh, man, you're such a wonderful person. Uh, we can do it. I can. I can. I mean, if you want Jesus, that's fine. If you don't believe in Jesus, that's fine fine if you're an atheist or a buddhist or a catholic or a mormon or a baptist or a methodist or a presbyterian it's all good it's mankind it's humanism we will conquer let's all unite let's all build a tower that will reach up to heaven and you know what happens mankind always messes things up you talk so great about mankind you know what I'm happy about? How I can talk bad about mankind. How I can trash mankind and say how wicked and how dumb and how much we let God down. You might say, that don't sound very positive. You know what sounds positive? That I don't have to depend upon myself but on Jesus Christ. That sounds very positive to me. Where I can empty myself where I completely humble myself and say, nothing of me, Father, right. it's all you. I want to talk good about God. I want to talk great about God. But how many times have you seen Ellen DeGeneres talk great about the Lord Jesus Christ? How many times have you seen CNN and Fox News talk great about the Lord Jesus Christ? How many times have you seen even our past President Obama, our current President Trump, how many have you seen... Uh, our current preachers today talk great yeah. about the holiness, the sovereignty, yeah. the greatness, and the magnitude of our God Almighty. Or do preachers today like Rick Warren, Joel Osteen, and many others talk great about you, you, and you? Today I'm going to preach you an absolutely positive sermon that's totally different from what you're going to hear from churches. The positive sermon is I'm going to trash you and raise up God. Amen! Amen! I'm going to trash you and raise up Jesus Christ today. And you're going to feel so great. You're going to feel so positive. You're going to feel so good. You know why? Because all you're doing is resting on Jesus Christ. This weak, little worm, pathetic sinner who's corruptible and who's going to turn into dust. All he has to do is just relax and rest on Jesus Christ. Doesn't that feel good? Yeah. All right. I'm so excited to preach to you. Let's talk about the first man who messed up. Let's talk about Adam. Adam and Eve lived in a perfect paradise and everything was great. It was so perfect. They didn't know what sin was because the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was the access to give them knowledge of what sin, uh, sin was, what's good and evil. And then you know what Satan did? Sir, that serpent slithered and then whispered in Eve's ear, he shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. For God knows that if you eat of it, your eyes will be open, open, beholding good and evil. Satan, he offered something better to Eve, thinking that she would think that this is better for her. And you know, that's the problem with Christianity is that you Christians, you have the devil whispering in your ear, offering you that fruit. And here you are, everything is great in your blessed assurance and God has been good to you, provided all your needs. And you think that there's something better out there that the world has to offer. And Satan, he offers you a piece of fruit. And it's so amazing that mankind will throw away God's perfect plan and his working in your life just for a piece of fruit. Just to taste the pleasure of sin for a season. 
How many of you are a testimony and evidence that after eating that fruit of sin, that it didn't get better? How many of you are evidence that it was only pleasure for a season? How many of you can testify that all you felt was guilt, further depression, and misery? How many of you can testify that after eating that fruit, then your eyes weren't open, your eyes just blinded even further, and then got you down further downhill into a road that's at, almost at a point of no return? And that's what sin does, and you can imagine Satan doing that to you right now. He probably did that to some of you yesterday and the past previous weeks. But you know what happened? I'll tell you what happened. You let God down. You ate the fruit. And you motivated other people to eat the fruit with you like Eve. Eve made Adam eat the fruit with her. And here are some of you getting other brothers and sisters in Christ to follow the same path that you did by your example. And you feel bad about it. You feel let down. And then God, he starts to judge you. And he says, what's your problem? And what do you do? You start to make excuses, right? When God lays down his chastening rod on you, don't you just make up excuses to God. God, I'm just too busy. God, you know that sin is too hard for me. I was born at a drug addict home. God, you know how, how much depression I'm going through in my life, so you got to understand why I would yield into sin that day. God, you know why I went back to my old lover, even though that lover is bringing me down to the wrong path. You know why I went back to the old friends, that old crowd, even though I know that they were in the wrong. Because, God, it's so hard to be alone. It's so hard to serve Jesus Christ. And, God, you got to understand, isn't that what we all do when we get caught? Isn't that what we all do? Yeah. We, when we all get caught, we make up excuses and good reasons and even spiritual reasons. Yeah. Yeah. So that we don't put the blame on ourselves. We like to put the blame on God unconsciously. You're not saying that consciously, but unconsciously, indirectly, you want to put the blame on God. Like Adam, the woman that thou gavest to me, she gave me the fruit and I did eat. God's like, are you blaming me? No, 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 I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I'm, I'm just saying, Lord, that I had a very good reason. My wife gave me the fruit. I didn't even see it all that time. Isn't that what we all do? What we all do is we indirectly blame the Lord that life is too hard. So you're saying that God's plan, that he has a fault somewhere? Are you saying that God gives you a burden greater than you can bear? Aren't you indirectly blaming the Lord for your faults when you got to realize it was all on you? Amen. I mean, we already see Genesis 1, and we can just stop right there about mankind. Genesis 1 is mankind. Genesis 1 is everything about mankind even today. Your Bible is not old-fashioned and out of date. It is current, up-to-date, repeating you. It's a reflection of you. And you know Adam and Eve, they sinned, they messed up. And you know what God had to do? Sin must be paid for, friend. Don't you remember when you let God down and now discouragement seeped in because now you're reaping what you've sown? And then now sin has a price to pay and you must be hurt. You must be judged. You must be punished. Everything will go. Everything that seemed to be flawless now had flaws in them. Every goal and plan that you planned out in your life now falls to pieces. Why? Because sin must be paid for. Satan must have his payment due. If he's going to make you bite it, he's going to make sure that he gets a reward out of it. Isn't that what happened to you? Isn't that what's going on with some of you probably right now where you're being judged for your sin and sin has such a heavy price that it's bringing you down, it's bringing your loved ones down? Oh, that hurts. It is so up to date. God told Adam and Eve the whole world now is going to face starvation, famine, disease, sickness. You have to work for your own food, your own clothing. You have to take care of everything. You never knew what sickness was, Adam, but now you're going to feel like what it's like to get sick. You never knew what depression was, Adam, but now you're going to feel those sorrows kicking in. You never knew what death was like, Adam. One day you will die and turn to dust. And now that dispensation at the Garden of Eden, that dispensation fell apart. God's plan, boom, for mankind, boom. Folded. God, I want to go back. And God says, no, you can't go back to the garden. Don't you want to go back to the garden? 
I come to the garden alone yeah. while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear. The Son of God discloses and he walks with me, talks with me, and tells me I am his own. And the joy that we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Get me back to the garden, Lord. And weren't you at a point where God says, no, you can't come back to the garden anymore? Weren't there points in your life where God, he can't give you back the blessing anymore? Where God, he can't put you back in his original plan anymore? Where God says, nope, you have to suffer the consequences of your sin. Will you please repair my home, Lord? And God says, no, that home will be broken. Lord God, will you please give me back my job? And God says, no, you can't get your job back. Lord God, can you give me back my friends? And God's like, no, those friends are gone. You want to go back. God can forgive you. He can forgive you. But he can't sometimes restore you back to your original place. You ever thought about that? Sometimes he doesn't do that. And it hurts your heart. It breaks your heart. And then you're like, what can I do then, God? What can I do? And as that dispensation folds and ends, you're like thinking, it's over. There's nothing good about this. Nothing to go back. And then you know what God does? You know what God does? I'll tell you what he does. Look at the book of Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. What did God do? In verse 21, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make what? Coats of skins and clothe them. I, can I get back to the garden, Lord? And God says, no, you can't get back to the garden. Is there any hope out there then for me? Why, sure, there's hope for you, Adam. And God says, you see that innocent lamb right there? And Adam says, yes, Lord. And then God says, bring me that lamb. God, Adam gives the sheep to the father, and the father, you can imagine, he's petting that sheep, and Adam and Eve, they love that sheep. It's so innocent. It's one of the dearest animals that Adam had the honor of naming, and all of a sudden, God takes a knife and slits its throat. And then all of a sudden, Adam and Eve, their heart breaks, and they melt as they see that innocent lamb shedding its blood. Innocent die. And then Adam said, what are you doing, Father? And God says, what I'm doing, child? And then God, he starts to skin that lamb. And then Adam and Eve are like, what are you doing, Lord? And God says, this is what judgment of sin is like. But my wrath and all of that suffering that the lamb has to go through, the lamb will be your scapegoat. It will replace your sin. Innocent will take your place because sin has to be paid for. You know what your problem is? You know what mankind's problem is? You think that as soon as you sin, you don't get payment. You don't get absolute hurt. There is such hurt. You got to understand there is such hurt, heavy price to pay for sin. There must be payment and judgment, heavy judgment for sin. And because of that, that's why you can rejoice on somebody else who took that wrath, that judgment, that price for you. You think that we just rejoice because Jesus died for us? Or do you think we rejoice because we know that we deserved hell? We were supposed to get our sins paid for. We were supposed to be spitting upon, beaten, crucified naked. But somebody else took that place for us. Don't you think that we would love Jesus better after that? Because it was a payment that you deserved, but somebody else took your place. If you don't understand that, then you try to be a person who is going to be sentenced for life in prison, and then somebody else took your place. Don't you think that you'll at least work up a little bit of gratitude after that? You'll understand that feeling? Jesus Christ did worse than that. He took all of your sin upon himself and was tortured mercilessly for you. That's right. And you don't think that you can love him? Show him gratefulness after that. That's what the lamb did, the lamb. Thank God Almighty that he had a lamb to take the place of Adam and Eve. And that's why Adam and Eve, they're saved by the blood because of the skin, the skins of the lamb. Amen. So that dispensation that ended in failure, God sent them a lamb for hope. And then what happened with Adam and Eve's day and age is that they all fell apart. 
During that age of conscience, mankind lived wickedly and in sin. They suffered disease, sickness, and hurt, depression, and there was murder. There was rape. There was envy, jealousy, covetousness that went rampant throughout the whole world, and chaos ensued. And because there was so much chaos, Adam and Eve's children were doomed into sin, into chaos. And that's where Satan, he took advantage. And he and the sons of God lived among the earth. And Satan and his minions start to live amongst the humans. And during that time, it was just chaos, complete corruption and chaos around the whole world. And you know what God had to do? God said, I gave you a conscience to live by. And now you're going to mess up this plan up. So I'm going to have to wipe out all of mankind. I'm going to drown all of you. Isn't there any hope? Isn't there any hope? And God says, why, sure. There's an ark right there. Right. Noah, why don't you build an ark? And why don't you preach for about a hundred years long? Because I'm merciful. Because I'm gracious. Because I want to give them a chance to get saved. Noah, why don't you preach for about a hundred years so that they can get a chance to come inside the ark? And you know what mankind did? They laughed. They mocked. They scoffed at Noah. They said, where's the rain, Noah? Some geologist from Harvard, Yale, so-and-so university, you know, school of de dead brain cells, goes to Noah and says, you know, that is not scientifically accurate about what's going to happen. Didn't you know about the geological formation and that the flood is a myth? None of this can happen and none of this works. And, well, you see that, what they do, what they do. And then Noah, what does he do? He keeps preaching. He keeps being faithful. Don't you see a reflection of that of today's day and age? Where you preach the word of God. Where you warn souls about God's coming judgment. God's judgment is coming. Don't you want to be saved? Come inside the ark and receive a safe haven. And you know what the world does? They mock you. They scoff at you. They say that you're a hate preacher because you preached about God's judgment. No, that's God's love and mercy that he'd warn you for more than a hundred years about his coming judgment. Two thousand years have passed ever since Jesus died. And mankind still will not learn their lesson. But isn't that you as well, child, where the preacher kept warning you through the sermon? And every Sunday you come, and you act like a pious, good Christian, and you can fool the pastor, you can fool the people sitting next to you, but you can't fool God. And here you are, you're scoffing, you're mocking, you're ignoring the preaching of the Word of God when God says, get out of that world, get out of that flesh, get out of that sin, Get out of your comfort zone. Get out of yourself what you want and come inside the ark and receive your safe haven. But here you are in the chaos of your Noahic age, complete chaos, trying to make sense of everything in your life. You got everything worked out. Your dreams, your ambitions, your sins you enjoy, your stubbornness of your character, your pride of your character, your arrogance of your character. And then here you are, you got some Noah preaching at you, and you refuse to go inside the ark. And then you know what God has to do? He has to send his flood of judgment and to wipe out all the world. But you know how that day and age ends? God sends a rainbow up in the sky. And God says, there will come a time that I will never flood the world again. Don't you want to thank the Lord God Almighty that when he flooded your life, and he destroyed things, and then he was judging your sin, that one day there's a promise in the future. Child, there's going to come a time that my chastening rod won't come down on you again. There's going to come a time, child, that sin will never hurt you again. And no matter how many sins you commit in your past, in heaven, it's going to be completely forgotten. Amen. In heaven, sin will never uh, catch up to you and hurt you. It's already in the past, child. God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will come a time when we are in the literal rainbow, up not in the sky, but up in the third heaven. Amen. And then we'll see that rainbow up in heaven. That's God's promise that I will never judge you again. I will never judge you again. We will be in heaven for all eternity, shouting the victory together. Can you imagine sliding on those streets of gold and swimming in the river of life and then sitting down in your mansion up in heaven, 
hugging the Lord Jesus Christ and any sin that you felt in your body, you never had that lust ever again. You never had that feeling, that temptation again. And it's like that every ounce in your body just wants to be holy, wants to be pure, wants to glorify the King of Kings. There's a promise, child, whenever you see that rainbow up in the sky, God will never judge you again. Aren't you glad for God's promise? And then as the Noahic age, it fell to pieces. So God had to put the rainbow up in the sky. And then it really start, started to fall apart when God gave them a brand new start. And guess what happened with mankind? They repeated again to mess up. Noah's family members, they all said, hey, uh, let's all build a tower that will reach up to heaven. Hey, man, mankind has the strength. We have the power. The environment is falling apart, but hey, guess what? We shall overcome. We shall overcome. Let's do it. Hey, let's sing that rock and roll music about singing about mankind, how we're going to overcome, how we're going to save the world, we're going to save the children. And let's, let's all gather, to, let's preach in our churches about you're, God, you're so, such a wonderful person. God loves you just the way you are. And mankind is so great, so grand. We have the ability. Let's bring in the kingdom together. How you got in schools where they're trying to brainwash their children about, you know, it's our ability as mankind that we can increase. We've gotten smarter the past years. Uh, you know, we know so much stuff now. And, oh yeah, we, we, through research, and science and the progression of mankind and evolution. We've gotten so much smarter back then. No, you're just as dumb as you were back at the dark ages. That's what happened. Mankind has just gets it just gets worse and worse. And mankind isn't that a reflection of the Tower of Babel of today? Let's all build this tower that would reach up to heaven. And we're going to have one day a one world united government and a new world order. Let's all get together, folks. Let us all build a tower that will reach up to heaven. Let's all do it. All religions unite. All nations unite. All different genders, sexes, cultures, and races unite. Let's all get together and unite, unite. And you know what mankind does through this unity? I'll tell you what happens through this unity. Mankind still faces crimes. Mankind still faces immorality. We have our children stuck on technology and looking at things that we never thought five-year-olds would see today. That's what happened with mankind. It just messes up all over again. And you think you've gotten smarter than before. You think you're better off than the Dark Ages. At least at the Dark Ages, you don't get easy access to what you see today. Amen. You know what's going on? I'll tell you what, it's, you see a reflection of mankind all over again. And don't you see that in your life today? How you're trying to elevate yourself, mankind? Mm -hmm. How you like to, oh, I don't like this preacher, what he's preaching right now. That's right, because you're at, the, you're at that stage like the Tower of Babel. You're a reflection of those people about mankind, mankind, mankind. And you don't like it when God puts down mankind. That's right. You don't like that. You don't like that at all. But God says that he is the person that you should turn up to and look up to, not man. Amen. Where do you see God in this picture at Genesis chapter 11 about let us build a tower to heaven? You don't see God in that picture at all. It's us. It's man. We, 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 we. Who is God? Oh, he has many different names. And it can be Jesus. It can be Allah. It can be Buddha. It can be you. It can be you. God in you. And then you know what happens? You know what God does? God has to judge, send down his judgment again. He's like, oh my goodness, you guys just won't learn. Do I have to send the flood all over again? You know what? I'll do, well, I gave a promise already, though. I gave a promise because I'm a merciful and a great God. And here you are messing up again, building up your own Tower of Babel of Sin. The hundredth time, right? And then here you go, and God's like, well, I gave him a promise that he's eternally secure. I gave him a promise I'll give him a home in heaven. I can't damn his soul to hell. What am I going to do to get that child right with God? You know what you got to realize, folks, is that as a Christian, you may have let God down many times. You may have reaped what you have sown, and you're depressed, and you're all worn out, and you're mad at yourself on how much you elevated yourself, your flesh, more than God. But at least you can have this comforting thought. 
God already gave a promise to me long time ago that he will not damn my soul in hell. God already gave me a promise long ago that I'm saved, that I'm secured. Do you know how many people that I've known, especially online, who've doubted their salvation because they fell back into sin again, who thought that they lost their salvation? My friend, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. And he gave a promise that your soul is eternally secure. He forever shattered the bars of sin. He forever shattered the chains of darkness. And he sealed you with this Holy Spirit. You can't go to hell even if you wanted to. If you're going to cry and scream, I want to go to hell, God will bring you up at the rapture up to heaven, kicking and screaming. At that point, you're already predestinated to go to heaven. God did not pick and choose who would go to heaven and hell long before you had a free choice. When you made a free choice, I received Jesus Christ so that I can be eternally secured. There was your predestination. You can't go to hell even if you wanted to. Because you know why? God already made a promise. Maybe there were some people who, who I can imagine say, Man, God, would you just judge them all? Would you just send a flood? But you know what God said? No, I already gave a promise. I already gave a promise. And you can thank God that he already made a promise to you a long time ago. That he's got you covered under the blood. That he's still on the throne. And he will bring you to glory. Aren't you glad that whenever mankind messes up, God always has some backup plan? God always is at the end to give you hope. Just because there is judgment, justice for sin and God's wrath, which must happen, which has to happen, that does not mean there's no hope. You will always see hope at the end. And here goes. God just... God, what does he do at the Tower of Babel? He confuses all of their languages. That's where all of us come to today here at San Jose Bible Baptist Church. We all come from different backgrounds and nations because God, he just scattered the languages. Because he said, no, you're not going to unite. You're going to divide. Yeah. You know why? Our God is all for rightly dividing. Amen. He's Amen. not all for uniting. Yeah. He's all for dividing. Amen. So then all the mankind scatters. There goes their one world government, new world order. Messed up. And then those people, God's like, well, you know, those people are messing up. I got to do something here. Well, I can't drown the whole world, so let me start with Abraham. A new nation. Let's start a brand new nation. Let's resort to that. So then God starts a brand new nation with Abraham. And you know what mankind learn? They never learn. They never learn. You know what Abraham does? He lied. Yeah. How many times? He lied again, too. He lied twice. He lied about his wife. Oh, she's my sister, not my wife. Yeah. What are you talking about, Pastor? Because when Abraham was living in a foreign land, he was afraid that they would kill him so that the king can marry his wife. So Abraham lied about his wife twice. One of the kings was actually sincere in heart, and he had no idea and then God told the king, hey, you're a dead man. And the king's like, why, God? And God said, well, because you took another man's wife. And the king said, did, did not Abraham say that she is my sister? And so this pagan king actually had more, had more sense than Abraham because the Philistine king told Abraham, man, you're supposed to be a prophet. And you lied about your wife being your sister. And I almost messed up. What did you do to us? Yeah. Please pray over us. Yeah. Some prophet you are. Yeah, right. Some prophet Abraham was. What a great founder of a new nation God provided. That he would lie twice. What a, what a great testimony that he ruined in front of pagan people. And isn't that like us Christians today where there are pagan people pointing out our flaws? Oh, some Christian you are. Some Bible believer you are. Is that what Bible believers do? Is that what they do? Oh, I didn't see you go to church that day. Oh, why? What happened? Uh, I saw you, you know, just cussing just now. I thought you were a safe Christian. Yeah, pretty much. Oh, you know, uh, I thought that you're all about abstaining from the world. What's this that I see in your room? What's that that I see in your car? And what's that that you're watching over there? Oh, I see on your shelf. You see that sometimes pagans have better sense than some Christians. And sometimes pagans live better than some Christians. If you won't go out soul winning, then Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses will knock on every door if you don't. Yeah, that's right. 
If you won't sing with all of your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, those Pentecostals and Charismatics, they'll speak in tongues and they'll pour out their heart. You got to realize this, folks, is that sometimes pagan and lost people have better sense than some Christians today. And here you are, you ruin your testimony, you ruined your life again. And you know what God does? God says, I gave an eternal promise that's without condition. It's an unconditional covenant. You want anti-dispensationalists like to say, no, I had a condition, I had a condition. No, not with Abraham. God gave an unconditional promise. I'm going to use your nation. You know what God gave to you and I? An unconditional promise. Amen. That you, he gave a promise that this group, this nation will persevere that the gates of hell shall not prevail against him. Amen. You know what? The gates of hell, they have persecuted God's nation. And I'm talking about the spiritual nation, the church. God, had, God has made the church stand strong. They tried to annihilate, eliminate God's church throughout ancient pagan Rome, throughout Roman Catholic Rome, throughout the time periods during the time periods where America and all the nations start to fall apart into the ecumenical movement, into modernism, to German rationalism. Yeah. And then God Almighty was just behind the scenes and that church still marched on. You know what? He gave an unconditional promise. Yeah, he Lord. gave an unconditional promise. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He gave an unconditional promise. The church will be raptured up to heaven before that new world order comes. He gave an unconditional promise. The church will still march on. Amen. Hey, man, you might not come back to church. You might fall apart. This church might fall apart. But there will be still be some Bible-believing church out there who will raise their King James Bible up on high, rightly dividing the word of truth and preaching the whole counsel of God. God gave an unconditional promise. Aren't you glad that God always got your back when you fall? And then guess what? Then you go to Isaac. And guess what? Isaac messes up. He lied, too, about his wife. To a king. You know why? Because he's following his daddy's footsteps. And then Jacob was even worse than Isaac. Because this guy was a professional liar. He didn't just lie once or twice. He was a professional liar. He deceived his father. He deceived his brother. He made sleazy deals. And then God made him reap what he sowed. He made Jacob's uncle pull, pull lies and tricks on Jacob. You know what that is? That's mankind. That's where you mess up like Abraham. Guess what? Your son will mess up too. Your daughter, your children will mess up. And then by the time you hit the third generation, it's really bad. And then when you hit the fourth generation, they're probably lost and they're not saved. Have you ever seen a Christian generation going back three, four generations strong? Or have you seen like a deteriorating phase with every generation? You know what? You, you don't learn. I'm still stuck at Genesis, folks. You don't learn. Mankind never learned their lesson. I told you I'm going to enjoy today's sermon. Yeah, I'm talking trash about mankind today. Because if you don't live right for God, your next generation is going to be worse than you. And then the, your third generation is going to be far worse than you. And probably your fourth generation is lost and going to hell. And your second and third generation don't know how to witness to them. And they're going to probably have to ask you to teach them how to soul win. Or maybe you still don't know how to soul win yet. Come on. And you're going to have to call your pastor who's probably dead a long time ago. What happened? This is mankind. This is mankind. This is mankind always messing up. But you know what God did with, with, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? What he did was he kept them going. What he did was he kept increasing them. They were in the land of Egypt, and Egypt represents the world. And as those Jews were in the land of Egypt, God made them increase. God made them fruitful. God multiplied them. As the book of Genesis Ended with Joseph in a coffin in Egypt, God still blessed and increased the nation of Israel. You know, Judah messed up. He committed uh, incest within the family. And then there was so many messed up sins with Reuben sleeping with, his, with one of his father's wives. It was such a messed up sin. The brothers turned against Joseph and sold him into slavery. What a wicked generation. And then you know what God did? He preserved that nation. He increased that nation. He used their sin for his good. And then what happened? Well, the land of Egypt put Israel, the Jews, through bondage for several hundred years. 
And so then God says, well, I'm going to have to send a Moses to deliver them. And you know what? I, I can see the Jews always messing up, messing up, messing up. I mean, from Abraham to now, they're just living real wicked. I'm going to have to set, set down rules now. Let's start a new dispensation. We're going to do the most, we're going to do the law right here. And I'm going to send down every specific rule. That way, there's, that way they can follow the rules. Maybe that will make things better. And God made rules and laws that would help his people, that would increase their nation in prosperity. God promising, I'm going to give you the promised land. You're going to be fruitful. You're going to multiply. You're going to conquer nations. You're going to become strong. And here are the Jews, all excited. Here are the Jews saying, yes, let's go to the promised land. I can't wait for a new kingdom. We're going to, we're going to be the most powerful nation in the world. I can't wait. And guess what the Jews do? What, what did men learn? They mess up. What do they do? You brought us out here in the wilderness to die. What are all these rules for? Oh, I don't like uh, I don't like these rules. We want a king like all the other nations. Yeah. Oh, woe is me. Woe is this. Oh, we should have died. Let's go back to Egypt. Egypt, Egypt. And that just made God even more ticked. Because he's like, I delivered you from the Egypt. And you want to go back to Egypt. I'm going to annihilate you. I, I'm fed up with mankind. I mean, ever since Adam, stupid humanity just never learned their lesson. I'm just going to wipe them all out. Moses, I'm just going to start brand new with just you, Joshua, and Caleb. That's it. I'm going to wipe them all out. And then Moses is like, no, 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 Lord. No, Lord. Think of your glory, Lord. Think of what those Egyptians might say when you kill all of them. And God's like, okay, okay, I'll let them go. I'll let them go. And his mercy and grace continued with those Jews. And then you know what he did with those Jews? Those Jews, they entered into the promised land. They started conquering nations through Joshua. And they got the promised land where they can live in peace and harmony. And God's mercy was upon them. But year after year, decade after decade, century after century, those Jews kept messing up over and over and over again. And then God's like, well, I will send you judges then. So he sent them a judge. But every time a judge died, the children of Israel repeated back to their sin. And then God had to punish them. And then after the, God punished them, the Jews said, okay, Lord, we'll get right with you. And God's like, okay, I'll send you another judge. And so the judge helps them out. But after the judge dies, guess what the Jews do? They go back into sin again. Then what does God do? He punishes them again. And what does God, what do the children of Israel do? We repent, we get right with you, and God's like, okay, I'll send you another judge. And then you go for, through the book of Judges, and when you read the book of Judges, it's a cycle over and over and over and over again. And you know who that is a picture of? You. Yeah, come on. That is you. God will send you a judge to lead you right. Let's go out soul winning. And he'll preach a sermon to get you right with God and stir up the church. But when the judge dies, when the judge is not there in the house with you, then what do you do? Oh, you go back into sin. You repeat a cycle all over again. And it's like that God has to send you a judge to keep you going. It's like God, he has to keep repeating a cycle that just never ends. And then when God sends his punishment on you, oh yeah, God, okay, I'll get back into reading the Bible. I'll get back into praying. I'll come back to church. I'll clean up my house again. And then when you do, then what happens? Then you lose it, and then God has to punish you again. And then you get right with God again. <laughs> and then you go back into sin again. God punishes you again. You get right with God again. And then guess what happens? You go back into sin again, and God has to punish you again, and then the cycle just never ends. It just never, never ends. Amen. It's a cycle that just, it's a vicious cycle that never ends. And then you know what happened? The Jews, the, they, they go through this malicious cycle, and they go to a point where they're like saying, okay, what we want is a king, not a judge now. We want a king, just like all the other nations. We want a king that will set things right. Like all the other nations. And then God has always been the king for the nation of Israel. But you know what the nation of Israel said? We don't want that. We want a king like all the other nations. And you know what you guys are like? What you people are like is that you want your own king rather than God being your king. You want your job to be your king. You want your children to be your king. You want your marriage to be your king. You want your money to be your king. You want uh, the world to be your king. You want something in your life to be your king rather than God Almighty. You know why? Because you repeated a cycle. 
And when you go through a cycle, you know what that happens? You don't recognize God as your king. You depend upon things that you see and feel and love on this earth to be your king. And God has given you his law, his rules that go from Genesis to Revelation, and you just keep rejecting it. You just keep not following it. And then it's like, okay, then God sets them up a king, right? Have you ever been to a point in your life where, Lord, I really want it that bad. And God's like, no, I'm not going to give it to you because I know it's going to do more harm than good for you. I know it's going to make you more worldly, more fleshy, not going to do it. And you beg and you cry and you're like, God, I can't come back to church unless you bless me with that. God, I can't serve you until you give me that. God, I can't. And God's like, okay, I'll give you what you want. Be careful what you ask for. Have you ever asked God for something and he gave it to you and it yes. just did more damage to you, more hurt for you? And you're like, I, I didn't think it'd be that bad. Sometimes you better thank God for no. Sometimes you better thank God he didn't answer your prayer. Sometimes it's best after you pray about it that you say, not, your, not my will, but your will, Lord. Your will be done. And has not God given you things in your life now that became a snare? Hmm? And those snares have brought you further away from your walk with Jesus Christ. Made you lose your love for Jesus Christ. That's what happened with the children of Israel. They got their king. They got their king. But you know what happened? Those kings, they fell into sin. And when they fell into sin, what happened to the whole nation? They fell into sin. All the nation fell into sin. You know what those kings did? They even sacrificed babies to false God, and the nation of Israel followed that. You got to realize, folks, that the king that you want in your life will lead you further down into a road of depravity right. that you never thought you would ever commit. Amen. Some of you, it's not too late to throw out that king, evict him from off the throne, and put back Jesus Christ. Oh. That cycle can end right now if you'll put Jesus back on the throne. And it's like that, it just kept continuing. Throughout the dispensation, it was horrifying. And the kings messed up. People started to mess up. And then God, he gave them a promise that he will send them a seed who will fulfill all the law, who will be their permanent king, and he will set all everything right. The Jews, they lost their nation, they lost their kingdom to the Babylonian captivity. And ever since then, up till 1947 to 48, Israel lost their kingdom and their nation. You know why? They just repeated a cycle over and over and over again. God's like, I'm done with you. I'm done. Look, folks, if, if you got a book that can go from uh, the beginning of Exodus all the way through the book of uh, Daniel or Jeremiah, that's a lot of patience from God's part. If you don't think that's long, then you try reading from Exodus to Jeremiah today, all right? And then you'll realize how patient God was. He was more patient than how much you could read in your Bible. And that, I mean, don't you see so much of yourself here, folks? Don't you see so much of yourself right here? This is a great picture of you, man. This is a great picture of you in every dispensation. And then so what God did, God did, he gave it up. He's like, okay, you're gone. You're done. I can't use you one day, but I will send you a king one day who will set things right. And you know what? You Christians, you try to set everything in order. You try to do everything right. You got your own system built up, and you know you could argue that America was founded as a godly nation, but I'm going to tell you one thing. Men never learn from history. You start out good, and then what happens? Kingdom, every kingdom, every nation falls apart. So my hope is not in America. My hope is for that king to come back yeah. and sit yeah. on the throne yeah. and set the White House and set the Vatican and set all the headquarters and capitals around the world back in its place. Yes. That's who I'm waiting from. Amen. Our kingdoms have fallen. And you got to realize this, folks, is that mankind is so wicked and has let God down that God has given up America. God has given up every single nation around the world. He has given them all up. He has to come back and set everything right. You see these churches saying, we're going to make the kingdom better. Let's build up God's kingdom on the earth. We're going to bring in the king. No, you can't make anything better. 
God himself has to come down, set everything right himself. Why are you so worried about your finances, setting your house in order? Who's going to be in the White House? Why are you so worried about your family? You got to realize this. All of that is done. Stop thinking about your 401k. Stop thinking about your plans in your future. What's going to happen to you in school, in your job, how to make things right with your family. You got to realize this. Why are you trusting in the systems of this world to make everything right for you? All of this is done. I don't panic about who's going to be the next president. If the economy gets worse or if the prices go higher or if job opportunities are even slower. I don't worry about that because who am I looking at? Who's the king that I'm looking at? Who will deliver me from all hardships, from all trials, from all storms? It's Jesus Christ. Shows who you're looking at, whose system you're trusting in. Doesn't mankind not learn from their mistakes from back then? They never learn in every dispensation. And finally, Jesus Christ comes down. And then John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And here comes Jesus Christ, and he died for you on the cross, shed his precious blood, raised himself from the dead, so that he can give you new life. You try to follow as best as you can. You try to live your best. My friend, haven't you remember those dark days? Or even right now where you're trying to get everything right in order, and you try to get right with God. You try to do a lot of good works. You got baptized, you cleaned up your sin, you tried to live holy for him, but you seem to let God down. You know who never, uh, you know who never let the Father down, who fulfilled all the law? That is the Lord Jesus Christ. He never broke one jot, one tittle. And you got to realize that there's a power in you that is greater than yourself, and that is Jesus Christ who fulfilled all the law. It is the spirit of liberty that freed us from the law. From bondage. And God says all you have to do is give in to me. Give in to the power of the Holy Spirit. To conquer your addiction. To conquer your temptation. To conquer your trials. It's, the problem with mankind is that we depend so much on ourselves. To solve our problems. Our sins. Our addictions. Our trials. When the Holy Spirit. God Almighty. Jesus God manifest in the flesh. Fulfilled all the law for you. All you have to do is give in to him. All you have to do is take it to the Lord in prayer. You don't think that when you cry out to God, God, free me from this problem, he's not going to start moving on you. He's not going to start working on you. Just turn to him. Don't turn to yourself. Turn to him. Thank the Lord Jesus Christ that he paid it all where mankind failed to fulfill the law. The Pope couldn't fulfill all the good works, no matter how celibate he lived and how many rules and traditions he followed. Buddha could not fulfill all the good works no matter how long he sat under a tree. Muhammad couldn't fulfill anything good out of the law no matter how many nations that he conquered. Moses, the Virgin Mary, John the Baptist, and every other figure in the Bible, David, Abraham, Adam, Noah, they could not fulfill the law. But Jesus Christ fulfilled all the law, died on the cross, set our souls free from a burning hell. At that dispensation that fell apart, Jesus Christ came behind the scene and said, I free you from the law. Problem solved. Under the dispensation of the law, I free you. I set you free. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You didn't have to die. Jesus died for your sin. Amen. Adam and Eve did not have to see another lamb die. Jesus, the Lamb of God, had his throat on slit, his hands and his feet pierced. He shed his blood on the cross of Calvary. He gave the victory for us. And now came grace. You, because under the age of grace, you know why? We don't have to stone each other to death for sinning. Because of grace, we can eat what we want. We can celebrate what day we want. Because of grace, we don't have to worry about a dictatorship that God has to set up to set us all in order. Because we're under the age of grace. Do you know why we don't have to beat up our enemies or conquer our enemies? Because of grace. That's why the Bible says, bless them that persecute you. Pray for them which despitefully use you. Love your enemies. You know why? Because we're under the age of grace. You know why God did not give you up? Because of grace. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. 
You know why you Christians can come back to church, get back to serving God again? Because of grace. Now, why are some of you wasting away His grace? Why don't some of you take His grace and get back to reading your Bible, get back to soul winning, get back to church, get back to getting rid of your sin, get back to God? Because His grace is greater than all of our sin. Do you believe in that? Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Now get back on the saddle and get back to serving God and kick discouragement at the rear end. All of us get so discouraged easily. Hey, who paid for your sin? Wasn't it Jesus Christ? Who did the beating for you? Wasn't it Jesus Christ? Then why don't you take advantage of his grace? Or are you still too prideful that you have to work your way out of it? That you have to do something yourself? Or won't you just rely on Jesus Christ and believe in his precious promise and get back to work into serving God? And then you know what happens at this age of grace with mankind for the past 2,000 years? Oh, we let God down. We let God down, right? Yeah, we let God down. And then here we are in, in America. God bless America. How can God bless America when we're so wicked? And then we all go to church. We sing Kumbaya. We all say, I love Jesus. And then let's do better to our fellow man. And then here we are condoning sin. We're condoning corruption in our government. We're condoning so much garbage in our world. Yeah. You know why? Because we're wicked. You would think that after Jesus died on the cross and giving us grace, we would take that as gratitude that I want to live right for you. I want to be holy for you. I want to live clean for you. And God dropped the law and gave us grace for salvation. And here you are just messing up. <laughs> what men learn from history is that men never learn from history. So it doesn't matter if God gave you an ark. You're going to mess up. It doesn't matter if God split your language and divided you. You're going to mess up. It doesn't matter if God gave an unconditional promise of a nation. You're going to mess up. It doesn't matter if God gave you a judge. You're going to mess up. It doesn't matter if God gave you a king on what you wanted. You're still going to mess up. It doesn't matter if God gave you his almighty grace where he died for you and gave up his life for you on the cross. You're still going to mess up. You are such a wicked person. And you got to realize that, thank God, that there was hope at the end. You know what that hope was? That hope was, one day I will rapture you and free you from this bondage of sin. And before this world goes to hell, I'm going to rapture you. And bless God, glory to God, where I've let my Savior, Jesus Christ, down over and over again. One day I will hear his trumpet voice and he will free me from this cage and he will break these bars open and transform my body into his likeness, into his image. Make me holy and pure, and I will never sin again. I will never let God down again. Amen. Thank God that there's hope for you. If you get depressed about sinning, you tell your flesh as soon as you sin, one day you're going to be raptured. One day you're going to die. One day you're going to be transformed. One day, whatever you wanted will never be known again. God gave you a promise of hope. He gave you a rapture. Why don't you look up rather than look down? Why do you keep looking down and getting depressed? And then you got mankind going off for seven years throughout the tribulation, doing whatever they wanted. Because that's what you all think. You think that whatever you want will bring you joy. Can I tell you something? There is pleasure in sin for what? A season. Do you know how long mankind will enjoy their sin after we get raptured? Only seven years. Only a few years at best. Only a few years. False promises of peace from the Antichrist. It falls into apostasy and persecution and chaos. And then the seals of revelation are opened up. The trumpets are sounded. And the vials are poured out. And there is earthquake. There is disease. There is sores. There is hailstone. Complete apocalypse as the world goes to hell. And here goes the Antichrist giving still false promises of peace. And the whole world, what do they do? They blindly follow that. Do you think the world repents and gets rights with God after that? The Bible says when God poured out his wrath, mankind still refused to repent. Mankind blasphemed God. Isn't that amazing? 
It's sickening about mankind still never learning their lesson. I don't know how many vials God had to pour out on your life or how much tribulation God had to pour out on your life to get you right with God, but you're still so stubborn and you refuse to repent and get right with God on the altar. It's like no matter what God does, you'll never get right with God. Preach. That will preach right there. But thank God that there's hope. Thank God that there's hope that when this kingdom falls apart, he'll set up his new kingdom. And there goes the millennium. And at the millennium at Revelation, he sets up his new kingdom on the earth. Revelation said the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And we shall reign forever and ever. And he is on the throne. He is in glory. And he gives you a paradise. He makes everything perfect and anew. And you know what? God, he's been blessing your life immensely with riches. He's given you your millennium, so to speak, of his promise. But you know what happens with mankind? I'll tell you what happens with mankind. Even if God blesses you, there's somewhere in the back of your mind that still wants to rebel. There's still something in the back of your flesh that still wants to let God down, disappoint him and sin. And guess what happens? That's what happens at the millennium. So the millennium, God set up his perfect kingdom on the earth after the seven-year tribulation. And after 1,000 years are over, you think mankind's like, all right, we'll serve you, Jesus. Everything is perfect. We got the Garden of Eden back. There's no more sickness or pain. You're in control over the world. I see you face to face, so I don't need science to prove it. I believe now that there is a God. No, they still rebel against God. You read Revelation chapter 20, Satan comes out of the pit, and there's an innumerable amount of people, millions to billions, who still follow the devil. And they rebel against God. And they say, we want our equal rights back. We want our unity, one world back. God, you're a supremacist. You're a dictator. And you know what God does? It's over. He sends down fire from heaven, burn up all of creation. And then you know what he does? He gives them a final judgment because God is sick and tired with man. It's over. At that final judgment, friend, this is what you want to hear. If you're not saved in Jesus Christ, this is what you want to hear. If you're not sure you're going to go to heaven after you die, this is what you want to hear. There's going to come a final judgment because God is sick and tired with you. God has been patient with you ever since 4000 BC. God has given a new plan, a new system, dispensation every time, and you always messed it up. And then God will give a final judgment, and he's going to say, why didn't you get saved? Why didn't you trust in the blood of my son for your salvation? What are you going to say to him at the final judgment, huh? He's going to cast your soul into hell. There's no pleading for mercy. There's no begging of mercy. No, no turning back. At that final judgment, it's over, friend. You know why? God's given you too much time already. You know what today is? Today is another example of God's grace. And when you walk out of the doors of this church huffing mad, and you go out of this church without getting saved, you know what that is another example of? God's grace and mercy giving you another chance to get saved. But don't expect at the final judgment he's going to give you that chance. He gave you all the chances you needed. At that final judgment, he will cast you into hell for all eternity. Or, or you can join in eternity with him. A new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. And there, folks, we will live happily ever after. I want to encourage you with something is this, is that Look, there is always a happy ending. Sin has a price. It has awful consequences. But there's always a happy ending with God. Was, was it not in every dispensation God provided you hope? Was it not in every dispensation God always lifted up mankind? What did he do with Abraham when he lied? He continued his nation. What did he do with Jacob when he sinned and lied? He continued his nation. What did he did with Moses when the law could not be fulfilled? He sent a savior to fulfill the law. What did he do with David when he committed adultery? God gave him the sure mercies. What did he do with the nation of Israel when they, uh, when they always sinned again after a judge? God sent them a new judge. What did God do with the church when the churches have fallen into apostasy? 
God has promised you the rapture. What has God promised to those in the tribulation? I will send down my new kingdom on the earth. Has not God always given hope ever since the beginning, back at the Garden of Eden? And he said to Adam and Eve, when they sinned against God, here is my lamb. And one day, you don't understand it now, but I will become that lamb one day for you. Church, you always mess up, but I'm going to tell you one thing. One thing, God never messes up. Why don't you get back to God? Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open. The altar call is open. If the Lord spoke it upon your heart, please feel free to come down here on the altar's floor. You can pray in your seat, or you can come down here for it on the altar's floor and pray. Has the Lord spoken upon your heart? Ever since the beginning of creation, creation, God has always picked up where man fell. God has always cleaned up the dirt that mankind has made. God is so good from Genesis to Revelation. My friend, are you 100% sure if you died today, you would go to heaven? Please listen to me if you're not saved. If you're not sure you're saved, please listen to me right now. Are you 100% sure you can go to heaven after you die? You might say, no, pastor, I'm not. Then I'm going to give you an opportunity right now to get saved. It's so easy. No one knows who you are. Every head is bowed and every eye is shut. I'm not going to point you out. You can get saved right now. You might say, how do I get saved, pastor? Three easy steps. Three easy steps. One, because you've sinned, you burn in hell. Well, I already know that, pastor. You preach that all day. That man messes up. Okay, good. You got it. There's step number one. Number two, Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected. Now, do you know why Jesus died for you? You might say, why? So his blood can wash away your sin. Because remember step number one, your sin puts you to hell, right? That's why step number two, you need Jesus' blood to wash away your sin. You might say, oh, I see why Jesus died. Correct. So now we're in step number three, step number three. Step number three, this is the last step, that's it. All you have to do is say to God, just tell God, okay, God, I know that I've sinned, so I'm only trusting in the blood of Jesus to save me. That's it. It's that simple. When you repent of your sin, all you can do is just believe on Jesus' blood to save you. That's it. You might say, Pastor, that is so simple. Can I get saved right now? Definitely. I'll give you a chance to get saved right now. With every head bow and every eye shut, no one is looking around. No one knows who you are. I'm going to give you a chance to say it to God right now to get saved. Uh, I'll give you the words. All you have to do is repeat after me. So you don't have to say it out loud. You don't have to say it out loud. You can say it inside, all right? You can say it this way. Repeat after me. Dear God, I repent as a sinner. I believe Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so his blood can wash away my sin. I only believe in your blood to save me, not myself. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Amen. If you would all bow your head and close your eyes one last time, please, one last time. We're almost done. We're going to finish up right now. In just two minutes, we're going to finish up. We're going to finish up in two minutes. Thank you so much for your patience. Every head bow and every eye shut. Okay. If you say, Pastor, I just repeated those words after you just now. I only believe in the blood of Jesus to save me, and I just repeated those words after you. 
could you just slip up your hand real quick, just real briefly? I'm not going to point out who you are. I'm not going to point out who you are. Just slip up your hand real br briefly. No one's going to know who you are. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much for your honesty. Thank you so much for your honesty. You can put your hands down. Thank you so much for your honesty. We're not going to point you out. Don't worry. This is completely private. Thank you for your honesty. If there was anyone else that I missed out, you could slip up your hand real quick. But if not, then we're going to close with a word of prayer. All right and let's close. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for salvation through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God, what an amazing book. Wow, what an amazing book. In every dispensation, cannot man learn from history on how gracious and merciful, sovereign and holy and almighty you've been in always providing a solution to a problem that man has created. And it seems like, Lord, whenever you've given us a solution, we create a new problem, don't we? <laughs> and then you have to provide another solution. Thank you, God, that you always got our back. you always given us hope, and we can end in hope. The church can end in hope when you sound that trumpet voice right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you can say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried, and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.
or should we just stick to the Sermon on the Mount? A passage that is so radical that it's doubtful that our own Defense Department would survive its application. King James onlyism is double standards. Now there's a false doctrine out there called dispensationalism. Yeah, I, I don't believe one saved always saved. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. <laughs> but you don't want to get identified with the reproach of what really believing this Bible is all about. You know what these wicked left-wing liberal perverts want you to do? Legalizing the marijuana or homosexuality or if the whole entire world turns against the Lord. Is that person saved? Is that person on their way to heaven or hell? The common person has no thought of God in their mind. That people will leave the church over the color of the carpet. What's wrong with our churches? Why don't we have a closer walk with Jesus? Why isn't everybody running around like little Jesus is shouting, screaming, and hollering? That thing you look in the mirror, it don't want to go street preaching. It don't want to read the Bible. It don't want to pray. It wants to watch TV and a bunch of other junk. A lot of you don't have it because you're lazy. That's why you don't have it. Because you won't work. That's why. Don't you know the Bible says, Whoa! Unto the wicked! And I'll tell you, Jesus Christ loved you enough. He came down here, put up with your dirty ways. The wages of sin is death. When you offer somebody a gospel track, if uh, you're walking away and you see them throw it on the ground, that's not because they're afraid of what's in it. They know what's in it. No matter where you are today, turn to God and place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God Almighty got me through and got me through for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, 35 years, 40 years. You mess with that book, honey, I'll mess with you. Shame on you if you don't read the Bible. Shame on you if you don't read the Bible. Shame on you if you don't witness with Jesus Christ. Shame on you. I'll have to whip this snot out of you. Just the fact, huh? Folks, just the fact that we're in Christ will never see hell is enough to shout about it. Give me your power, Lord. You know what we need? We need people to fall on their knees. We need people to pray to the Lord, raise the King James Bible high, believe in this sensational truth, and Lord, I just don't want their power. I pray like Elisha, double the portion, Lord. Do it within me. Do it within me, the filling power of your spirit. Give me your power, Lord. Give me your power. Give me your power. And God, the Holy Spirit, will move upon this church and fill within him his Holy Spirit power. Amen. Then we'll see soul saving. Then we'll see God do something with this truth. Then we'll see the liberals and the homosexuals getting a thing. Then we'll see those apostate Christians getting mad. Then we'll see all the world opening their eyes to the truth and they say, yeah, uh, we have not seen such a thing. Brothers and sisters, there's only one hope. Looking for that blessed hope of the glorious appearance of the man God, our Savior, Jesus Christ.